chapter 1. We're thinking this morning about the missionary's message, the missionary's message from Romans chapter 1. I've been so enriched by the fellowship and getting to meet so many of you, to reconnect with some of you last night and this morning. And uh, again, it's good and fitting and right that we are here together this weekend to think together about missions. Chuck, I love you You nudging us along the way, every step of the way, uh, to think about missions, even the card to fill out, and so we don't just receive some content and some interesting stories, but hopefully by uh, tomorrow we have been, uh, in a very real way, mobilized, each one individually, his families, and more broadly, the churches that we represent. So we're thinking this morning about the missionary's message. We'll be looking together, really in verses 16 and 17. But we will be, be bobbing in and out of the preceding verses by way of context and to frame for us what we are thinking about this morning. As I shared last night, when you think about the history of missions, generally there's a sequence that goes something like this. An awareness where God begins to put on our radar what he is doing globally and what needs to be done globally for the sake of Christ. That awareness tends to, to migrate to a, a burden. Uh, a desire to see men and women come to faith in Christ. Uh, a burden over the fact that many, many people do not have access for the gospel, even as we gather in this comfortable place on a Saturday morning in March of 2022 and all the technological capabilities that, that this world now knows, there still are many far from the message of Christ. So that awareness leads to a burden, and that burden prompts God's people to be stirred to pray, to be stirred to go, to be stirred to send, and to be stirred to sustain. And every one of those steps along the way historically have been essential for a lasting missionary work to take place. And so we pray that God will deepen us in this regard here. Last night we saw Romans chapter 10. And together we looked at that great passage last night and we, we thought about the missionary's mandate. The fact that God has made in his infinite wisdom and in his perfect plan, the preaching of the gospel, the speaking of the gospel, the teaching of the gospel, the translation of the gospel, the essential step for people to come to faith in Christ. That people are not saved apart from the gospel message and apart from believing that gospel message. This morning we build upon that and we're thinking now about like what is that message and how does that message work and how has God used that message in the story of redemption? And we look to Romans chapter 1 for this consideration, Romans chapter 1. Now as we enter this book of Romans, and I said a few things last night by way of context, but let me remind us again. We enter this book of Romans and it is the great apostles, great letter to the believers in that great city. Ancient Rome was a little bit like our modern-day New York City and Washington, D.C. being rolled together in one. A, a hub of, of economic might, a hub of cultural influence, a hub of political activity and decision-making, a, a hub of military power and influence. So it's hard to overestimate the stature that Rome occupied in the ancient world. And so Paul, wherever he saw a city... He knew that, that if the gospel took root in that city, and if a gospel church took root in that city, that as people would come and go through that city, the gospel would be taken to distant places. He did that in places like Ephesus, and like Thyatira, and like Smyrna, and like Philadelphia, and all these different little cities around the Mediterranean region. But he really wanted to do it in Rome because the greater the city in size and influence, the greater the opportunity for the gospel in expansion, in growth, and in distance proclamation. So in Romans, we see this, this passion for the gospel take root as he's writing to these believers and unpacking what the gospel is and our call to preach it and teach it and how it impacts every area of life. And he does so, it, it just reads like with a double sense of urgency because of the stature of the city. We see in verse 1 as Paul opens the book, he says, I, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul here is, is, is in a sense giving the appropriate credentials that he has. He reminds them that he is a bondservant of Christ Jesus. A bondservant is one who has forfeited rights, one who is indebted to his master. 
And so before he states that he's an apostle, he says, I am, I am given. I am one who has been redeemed by Christ. I am owned by Christ. I am his agent. I am his messenger. Indeed, verse 1, I am his apostle. And I have been set apart, verse 1, for the gospel of God. It's not accidental he begins this letter this way because this letter is the great unfolding of the gospel of God and all of its glorious riches. And so here he says, this is my calling. This is my task. Then look down with me in, in verse 9 where he begins to speak more directly about his burden for these people and his burden for the gospel to be taken forth. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. Why? For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each one of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. I often plan to come to you, but have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So he says, I want to go to Rome, I want to preach the gospel, and I want to see spiritual fruit fruit from that ministerial work, from that, that, that missional work in the city, I want to see it in your midst. Sounds a lot like what we talked about last night, the awareness and the burden. So much so, he begins to use terms in verses 14 and 15, terms of indebtedness. Know what he says in verse 14. I am under obligation, both to Jews and Greeks, to barbarians but to the wise and to the foolish. So as for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you in Rome. To be under obligation is to owe someone something. Now, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, uh, known for the Chiefs, known for the Royals, known for barbecue, known for hot summers and cool winters, uh, and, and various other things along the way. But we're also known for the Mafia. And some of you realize that uh, when you think of the mafia, people tend to think of New York City and Las Vegas, but Kansas City has always been one of those cities that's kind of behind New York and Chicago and Las Vegas, especially in the 20th century, is having a significant mafia presence. Well, if you live in a mafia town, and if you interact with the mafia, which I have not done, you, 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 you purpose never to be under obligation to a member of the mafia, right? They ask for those favors to be returned in and, and times and places and ways that, that you probably will not want to repay. More broadly in life, it's a good decision, a good practice not to be obligated to others financially or some other, some other, some other uh, commitment you have to them to where they can leverage that over you in unhealthy ways. But Paul here says, I am under obligation to, to, to Greeks and to barbarians, wise and to the foolish. What did these people groups have over Paul? It's not that they had something over Paul. It's that Paul was under obligation to them because of what he had gained through Christ in the gospel of Jesus, you see. The transformative gospel that he had received and the call that the apostleship that he had been given makes him one who is under, God, up under obligation to, to Greeks, to barbarians, to the wise, and to the foolish. In other words, everyone, everyone he feels indebted to. So much so, verse 15. As for me, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. So we come to our passage this morning where we see in verse 16 with this rolling sense of not just passion for Christ, passion for the gospel, but a sense of, of, of obligation to see the message spread in their midst. I gotta tell you, brothers and sisters, I believe the evangelical church in the main is void of a sense of gospel obligation. A few years ago, my, uh, my daughters were playing junior high girls basketball, okay? Now there's an important point here, so stay with me. 
And junior high girls basketball does not sound that important. But when those are your junior high girls playing, it's pretty important. And so my wife and I, we follow those games and uh, love going to those games. And uh, it was in the season, their little conference tournament. And our, they, our kids are in a little, very small little Christian school. And so this league is a very small little league. And it's a lot of homeschool families and, and, and groups there. And so they're end of the season, conference tournament is there. And we're, it's like a Thursday afternoon. We're in this little church gym. And, and we're like BBs in a shoebox. There are probably like 40 or 50 parents in this gym watching these, these junior high girls play and uh, watching this game. And my wife and I, I like to sit on the, the top row of the balcony so we can lean back against the wall. So we're up there watching. And we're watching the game, and these referees clearly needed some assistance. Have any of you guys ever been there, right? Th these refs are clearly struggling, okay? And we're watching the game, and, and they keep calling fouls on the other team, and they're not calling fouls on our team. And anyway, or excuse me, they're calling fouls on our team, not calling fouls on the other team. And uh, watching it, well, anyway, we're getting close to halftime, and, uh, and they call a foul on my daughter. Another foul on my daughter. Well, I look up, and the fouls are eight to two, eight fouls on our team, two fouls on the other team. And I, was, I'm no, I don't get angry at games. I'm not that. But I'm, just, I'm, I'm, con I'm a concerned spectator. <laughs> and, uh, and we're watching that, and I'm a concerned spectator. And, uh, and uh, I, 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 it's sometimes the Christian thing to do is to help a brother out, right? And these refs clearly <laughs> needed some help. And so I just, uh, I, 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 didn't, I wasn't mad. I just kind of, with an elevated voice, said, uh, in that moment, right before this little girl's about to shoot her free throw, was, the whole gym is dead quiet. I just said, I said, the fouls are eight to two. Let's even it up, refs. Well, like every head in the gym turns and looks at me. And my wife hits me and says, I cannot believe you just yelled. And I, I said, sweetie, I didn't yell. I just made a public observation. <laughs> And I want to make a public observation this morning as we wake ourselves up for this conference. I'm not angry. I'm not yelling. But I am quite clear. The average evangelical church has hardly any sense at all of awareness and burden and obligation for the gospel. We are comfortable. We are sleepy. We indulge in entertainment. We prioritize fellowship. And somewhere along the way, we've drifted far from an alertness and a burden and an indebtedness for the gospel. So Paul's sense of burden, Paul's sense of obligation, culminates in verse 15 where he says, For me, I'm eager to preach. For me, I'm eager to go. For me, I'm eager for Rome. Now, let me sharpen the point here for a moment. I want to encourage you to pray, not just in the general sense, that God would, would awaken us to global needs and opportunities. Yes, that, that's good. But I want to encourage you, as you pursue that prayer, to ask God to sharpen that for you in some personal, direct, specific way. I mean, it's one thing to want all your neighbors to come to Christ. It's another thing to be burdened over that neighbor. It's one thing to want everyone in your workplace to come to Christ. It's another thing to pray and to pursue that coworker. And I love how even here we see Paul triaging, as it were, his ministry opportunities. Paul wanted to preach the gospel everywhere. He wanted to go everywhere. And he did preach and go pretty much everywhere. But Rome is elevated in a unique way because of the gospel need and opportunity there. What might God be elevating in your heart this morning? Who might God be elevating in your heart this morning? Where might God be elevating in your heart this morning? Okay, look with me now in verse 16. And here we begin to see the message itself. Now, what we see presented in verse 16 and 17 is, is in encapsulated form all these chapters that we follow. But it's an encapsulation, a summary, an encapsulation that really does come with force because it indicates for us the gospel itself. Notice verse 16. And we see from verses 16 and 17 just basically three words of instruction or three words for us about the gospel. And the first word simply is that, that we should speak the gospel boldly. Notice verse 16. Paul says, I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel. To be ashamed of something means to, to, to feel a loss of status 
due to your identification with it. To be ashamed of, of someone is, is to not want to be around them because their sullied nature will sully your reputation. To be ashamed brings a sense of embarrassment, a sense of, of loss. And Paul is saying, first and foremost, out the gates, I am not ashamed by my affiliation with the Lord Jesus Christ or His saving message. Now, it's easy to see this 2,000 years removed, isn't it? It's easy to see Paul as the great missionary theologian, multiple mission trips, 13 New Testament letters, the guy who everywhere he went seemed to turn cities and towns upside down. It's easy to say, well, of course he wasn't ashamed. He was the, God, he was the Apostle Paul. Yet if you go back 2,000 years and reflect on this moment, if anyone who had cause to be ashamed, perhaps it was the Apostle. Think of what he lost. We know his story of conversion in Acts chapter 9 and other places. We know his credentials, his station, his status in life religiously and even professionally and culturally before Christ. And he was one who in Philippians chapter 3 we see gave up much to be identified with Christ. And then we went and preached what happened in Philippi. They locked him in jail. Thessalonica, they ran him out of town. Athens. They mocked him. Damascus and Berea, they had to smuggle him out of town. Corinth, they called him a fool. Jerusalem, they called him a blasphemer. Lystra, they stoned him and left him for dead. The list keeps going, brothers and sisters. The point I want you to see is this man gave up much for Christ. Much! Yet he says, I'm not ashamed. Indeed, I am, I am willing to endorse it boldly. I believe it. I am willing to endorse it boldly and be affiliated with it, to be associated with it. He was not ashamed. Why? I believe that boldness is driven by a keen awareness of what Christ had done for him. He's not ashamed because he knows the Lord Jesus Christ has died for his sins, has made him right before God, and has positioned him for an eternity with God in heaven. He's not ashamed of the gospel. What is it like for the 21st century church not to be ashamed of the gospel? It's very easy for us to get caught up in, in, in cultural moments, cultural needs, cultural opportunities, cultural conversations, and we can spend all of our time sort of caught up in you know, the latest mask mandate or the latest news item through, through, through cable news or the latest geopolitical happening or the latest economic happening or the latest neighborhood event. And it's very easy for us. Indeed, it's like the gravitational pull is towards minutia and triviality. And our social media feeds pull us into the mundane. Our cable news, news pull us into the... Uh, into, 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 polemical edges and debates. And all that's pulling us away. But what if God's people were able to kind of shirk off the distractions, the temptations, the allurements, and have a renewed sense of gospel boldness? In distant places, but in near ones as well. The missionary's message begins with a commitment to endorse the gospel boldly, to speak it boldly. Like Paul says here, I am not ashamed of the gospel. But secondly, it's also a call, brothers and sisters, to expect the gospel to work powerfully. To expect the gospel to work powerfully. Notice what we see in verse 16. I want to, to really drill down here together. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. He uses this word here, the power of God. Now, I won't get into a, a deep word study here, but, but it's, it's the picture of capable of accomplishing whatever God so intended. It's the picture of, of, of a forcefulness through this message that is unstoppable. 
a capability through this message that is uncontainable. It's the picture of, 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 of something taking place when the gospel is preached and the spirit is working that outstrips any human calculation, that outstrips any human assessment as to what might take place. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. What is this gospel? What is Paul referring to here? Well, quite candidly and quite clearly, he's referring to the saving message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the message that begins way back in the book of Genesis with the picture of a sovereign God who created all that is, who spoke everything into being. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that depicted so clearly that God is creator. And since he is creator, he is owner. And since he is owner, he is governor. God created all that is in Genesis 1 and 2. And the pinnacle of his creation was Adam and Eve. And he placed them in the garden to steward over all that he had created. But you know the story of Genesis chapter 3 temptation enters in. And Satan comes in the form of a certain, and Satan wanting to make wrong all that God has made right. He tempts Eve and tempts Adam, and they plunge themselves and all of their posterity into sin. And immediately as God confronts them in the garden, it's, and a sacrifice must be made, and they, their, their eyes are awakened, and they perceive their own nakedness and their own embarrassment, and so they slay animals for coverings, and immediately we see the shedding of blood for the atonement of sin. And then throughout the Old Testament, we see a picture of his people and God wooing his people and God, and God, and God providing for his people and God caring for his people. And we see a pattern in the Old Testament of his people being called out, but his people falling into sin. And that's a pattern that we see repeated throughout the scripture and in our own lives, do we not? But throughout the Old Testament, we see God raising up prophets to speak to them about one who would come, a Messiah who would come and would redeem them from their sins. And the prophets of old pointed to this one and spoke of this one who would come and make right all that Adam and Eve had made wrong. And the prophets would speak of our need to be saved, not just someone else's need. Because as Romans 5 tells us, when Adam sinned, he plunged all of us, all of humanity, into that sin with him. The prophets foretold of that coming Messiah. Ceremonially, typologically, we see the picture of that coming sacrifice. And we're taught that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so all of this Old Testament expectation... All of this prophetic foreshadowing, all this typological anticipation coming together until one day John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's the message that God's Son was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, fully God, fully man, the God-man. He spoke as no one had spoke. He taught as no one had taught. He healed the lame. He gave sight to the blind. He fed the multitudes. He walked on water. He calmed the storms. He raised the dead. But his very life of purity, of power, was a living indictment of all that was wrong. And so religious men and political men, Jews and Romans and many others, saw Jesus' perfect life and perfect teaching as a living offense. And so they conspired together to put him to death. He endured arrest. He endured persecution. He was placed before six different kangaroo courts consecutively the night before his crucifixion. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was nailed to a tree. He was pierced on the side. His crown of thorns was placed on his head. He died a literal death for us. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he was raised to life again. He appeared to many, to multitudes he delivered the great commission and then he was ascended into heaven where he was taken and placed at the right hand of the Father where he reigns now and he is coming back one day for his people and for the final judgment and the ultimate consummation of all things. Pastor, preacher, do you believe that this morning with every fiber of my being? That is the gospel message. And so Paul goes throughout the Mediterranean region preaching that message that this man whom you crucified, God has raised from the dead. This one that you rejected has become the capstone 
This one that you persecuted, he lives and reigns over all. And wherever that message was preached in power, in the power of the Spirit, things happened. But what happens? Well, that's what Paul says in verse 16. What does this message do? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What is the power of this gospel? What do we see here? What's t- what do we see taking place? Well, this gospel saves in three different ways. From the penalty of sin, the practice of sin, and the pain of sin. And so as we preach it, as we share it, there's a sense in which what's always on the forefront of our minds is the fact that the gospel saves us from the penalty of sin. There is a penalty for every sin committed. And it's just as ironclad as those photos of my car going through the traffic light last night. There will be no confusion, no arbitration, no negotiation, no rebuttal, no counterpoint. We all stand condemned before a holy God but the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. So when we preach the gospel, we think about being saved from the penalty of sin. And this message is powerful enough to save from the penalty of sin. And brothers and sisters, we believe this morning, I believe with every fiber of my being, that there is truly a hell to shun and truly a heaven to gain. Both are real places, more real than the room we're in, than the desk I stand behind, populated with real people who will feel real pain, separated in real darkness. But the gospel tells us we are saved from the wrath to come. I, uh, three years ago, spring of 19, I received notification that I was being summoned for jury duty in Kansas City. Okay, now I know that I'm going to... uh, Revealed myself as a very strange individual. But all of my life, I want to have jury duty, Pastor John. And I had never been selected. I always want to have jury duty. I'm not saying I want to do it annually, but I'd always wanted to have jury duty, like at least once. I had never been selected. Well, I get notification that I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm supposed to report for jury duty. And so I tell Karen, I'm, I'm delighted the dates work. I'm going to be in town. It's in the summer. I can go. And so this to me is like going to Disneyland. I mean, I'm fired up about jury duty. So I, I get dressed up because it's important, and I go down there, and I'm seated in a room with you know, about 100 other people. And, uh, and you're called there, and then there's a calling process, right? And you go from like 100 to like 12 or and a couple of alternates. And so, so this calling process, I told my, there's no way I'm going to get, there's no way they're going to select me. I'm a Baptist minister. Like, there's no way a Baptist minister is going to get selected in jury duty. Anyway, I get picked to be one of the 12. So I'm like, all right, the Lord is in my jury duty. I'm picked to be, picked to be one of the 12. I'm jazzed about this. And so, so then I get picked to be one of the 12. Well, then they, 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 they tell us what's going on. They pull us in a room. And the first thing we have to do is, is select a foreman. And guess who gets selected foreman? Okay. Well, this is like the highlight of my life at this point. I get selected foreman. And uh, so I am foreman of this jury. And so let me tell you guys, I took this as seriously as one could take it. I got a legal pad. I'm taking notes of everything that's said in court. And this is, this, is a, um, this is not a criminal. It's a civil case, but it's a, an important civil case. There's big time money involved. And this uh, whole process takes the better part of a week for me. And uh, we finally go into the room to deliberate. And I'm there. I'm telling you, I, I am treating this so seriously. And I got my notes there. And, and all of us treat it seriously. And we are comparing notes and we're deliberating and talking. And, you know, the time's going by, minutes turned into hours, and we're able to shepherd this process along. And I think with clarity, with certainty, with conviction as to how this needs to be decided, and we, we, brought, our, we brought our decision public. Let me tell you, we were as thorough and as careful as humans could be, but we could still be wrong. Our knowledge is an imperfect knowledge. Our decision it was subject to debate. But God's knowledge is perfect. His verdict, not subject to debate. His findings, beyond question. All of us who have lived, all of us born apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, saving work for us, we have committed incalculable sins that are a violent offense to a perfectly holy God. And his knowledge of that is clear, is unmistakable. His assessment is without error. His verdict will be unchallenged. 
But praise be to God, the missionary's message, the gospel, through simple repentance and faith, makes right, because of the work of Jesus, all that we had made wrong on our own. So the gospel message, it's powerful to save us from the penalty of sin. Notice also, it's, it's powerful to save us from the practice of sin. Now here we're not talking about a, of perfection, of course not. We're not talking about perfection, but we are talking about that when we preach the gospel and when the gospel is embraced and a person comes to faith in Christ, that their life is changed. Before conversion, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. There is no confusion. We are like these beautiful lays um, that we have been given and we've enjoyed wearing. And, and we know so well on this island, a lay is beautiful. It smells fresh. It looks fresh. It is fresh, but it's dead. You refrigerate it, you keep it cool, hoping to, to extend its usefulness from hours perhaps into days, but they are cut flowers. They are dead, though they look alive. Brothers and sisters, apart from Christ, you can be the best looking person in the room. You can be fit, you can be active, you can be attractive, but you are spiritually dead. You are a spiritual zombie. When a person comes to faith in Christ through the preaching of the gospel, they're made alive, their, their chains fall off, their hearts are free. The Spirit comes to live within us. The Spirit comes to live within you. And as Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you are free indeed. And this is the beauty of the gospel message, that when we come to faith in Christ, He saves us from the practice of sin. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Are you telling me that the news is so good that if I become a believer, I'll never sin again? Unfortunately, no. But I am telling you that when you become a believer in Christ, the Spirit begins to work in you and the Word begins to shape you. And you find yourself increasingly looking like our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes someone will say something to me like, I don't think I'm a Christian because I'm still struggling with sin. And I say, no, actually that's the best sign you are a Christian, that you are struggling with sin. Unbelievers don't struggle with sin, they enjoy sin. Believers are the ones that the Spirit is within them warring against the flesh moving them progressively into greater sanctification, leading them forward. And so the promise of the gospel here is not perfection or freedom from sin, but it is saying that if Christ has come within you, you should expect your life to change. We're not looking for perfection, but we are looking for a little progress along the way. I've seen fractured marriages restored to the gospel. I've seen people walk away from abuse of the bottle or abuse of the pill or other sorts of narcotics through the power of the gospel. I've seen the gospel change people's sense of identity and where they pursue pleasure and their sexual activity following Christ through the gospel. You see, a faithful pastor and a faithful missionary, we are more than professional empathizers. We have a message that can change you. Remember the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19? Time doesn't permit us to turn there, but I love that story because it's one of the greatest pictures of repentance and life change in all the Bible. Remember what happened? We were told in Luke chapter 19 that Jesus is passing along the way and he's there teaching and crowds are beginning to follow him and, and, and folks are curious about what's taking place. And In the Gospel of Luke, we see this presentation multiple times of, uh, of the tax collector as to what the tax collector, the publican, looks like. And we see in the Gospel of Luke... We see the picture of even of Matthew's conversion, who was a tax collector and the Lord saved. And Zacchaeus is a man we know who, who was a tax collector, and he was not only a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector, the only such title we see in the New Testament. And he's collecting taxes in the city of Jericho, and Jericho is, um, is where you want to be if you're a tax collector. Jericho was, um, was a, a, an attractive city with a nice culture, a, an enjoyable climate, and it's where people with money went to retire. In the ancient world, you may want to own a timeshare in Jericho. If you're a tax collector, it's where you wanted to be, because that's where the money took place. And the system was corrupt, right? And, and as the Romans, as long as you collected their share, you could skim off the top. And Zacchaeus had done that. And Zacchaeus was a hated man in town. And, and the story, remember, Jesus is coming along, and Zacchaeus is stirred for some reason. Perhaps the ministry of the Spirit drawing him to Christ, and he's curious about Jesus' teaching, and he's heard about this man who's performing signs, and he goes to see Jesus. But there's a crowd, and a crowd so thick, Zacchaeus can't elbow his way through the crowd to find Jesus. So this little man scampers ahead down the road, anticipating where Jesus will go. He climbs up in a sycamore tree. 
He's there positioned to see Jesus. And Jesus comes by, and Zacchaeus not only sees Jesus, but Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And he looks up, he calls him by name, he says, Zacchaeus, come down, for today I must go to your house. Now, typically, when we think of that story, we sing it in our churches and whatnot. We typically kind of end with this sweet exchange between the two. But remember what takes place. We see a picture of, of repentance and life change from Zacchaeus when we are told that Jesus hurries, or that Zacchaeus hurries and comes down and receives him gladly. Zacchaeus doesn't loiter on the branch, take out his notepad, draw a T-square, and identify the pros and cons of following Christ. He shuffles down that tree. He receives Jesus gladly. And he does so publicly where everyone understands what's going on, and they are expecting that if he's following Jesus, this will, will change his business practices. And Zacchaeus identifies with Christ. He hurries and he comes down. Uh, when the crowd see this, they're grumbling at Jesus and saying he's gone to be the, the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stopped and says to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. In other words, there are very clear Old Testament expectations of restitution. Zacchaeus, through this act of life change, where the gospel has worked in his life in Luke 19, Zacchaeus outstrips every Old Testament expectation of restitution. Why? Because the gospel has changed his life. When I became a believer in college, as I mentioned last night, um, I was a part of a, a Friday morning men's Bible study group. And I was like 19, 20 years old. The Bible study went on for about two years. And me and about another nine or ten guys, we met on Friday mornings from 5.30 till about 7. And it was taught by a, a, an older gentleman, uh, not old, but, but about 20 years older than us. And so he was a very mature man. He led this Friday morning Bible study, and, uh, and, and we all went to it. And you knew the Lord was in it because, like, we showed up at 5.30 every Friday as college guys. And, uh, and we're there, and we study week after week, and, and God just used it so profoundly to change our life. But in that Bible study, I met a guy uh, who, who came to it, a little older than us. He was, like, in his 30s then. His name was Richard Burton. Richard had become a believer a couple of years earlier in Mobile. And Richard, before he became a believer, Chuck, he owned a, a nightclub named Pandora's Box. And Richard's nightclub was named Pandora's Box because all sorts of ungodly things took place within those walls. Richard becomes a believer. Richard is convicted over what he's been making money doing. Richard takes a jug of gasoline and a match. Richard goes to his nightclub when it's empty he burns the place down, not to defraud the insurers. He acknowledges what's happened. He burned it down because he could not come up with any proper use for the facility. So he just burns it down so someone else doesn't lead other people into sin in that facility that he owns. Now, wait a minute, Jason. Don't you think that's a little extreme? I do. But I'll tell you this, beloved. I don't think the 21st century church, generally speaking, errs in the direction of spiritual extremity. We have become so cozy, so comfortable with spiritual suboptimality that when we see someone on fire for Christ, they just look like religious fanatics. What I love about Romans 1.16 and the power of the gospel is we are reminded that it brings life change. That which we once enjoyed, whatever our hobbies, whatever our sin patterns were, the Spirit begins to convict and change. That which we once filled our mind with, the Word of God begins to displace. Idleness begins to be displaced by ministry activity. And here's the glory we see, whether it's Zacchaeus or Richard Burton or your life if you come to faith in Christ or mine, is that when the Gospel changes our lives. We are not just saved from the penalty of sin. Praise God. The Spirit begins to work within us, and we are increasingly saved from the very practice of sin itself. 
Finally, in verse 16, there was my time is about up. We see not just that the gospel saves us from the penalty of sin and the practice of sin, but just briefly, the pain of sin. What do I mean by that? It's all in this rich word of salvation, this rich theological concept of salvation. That if you understand what Christ has forgiven you for, you need not limp with shame over what you once did. And I speak to a room this morning, and some of you guys are poised, and you're here on a Saturday morning that shows a certain level of commitment, but, but some of you perhaps limped into the room this morning because no one else knows it, but eight years ago you had an abortion. No one else knows it, but 14 years ago you defrauded a business partner. No one else knows it, but you have a pattern of sin, of hostility, and, uh, and guilt in your mind because, of, because your, your father died with a broken relationship because you had sinned against him. Many of us, perhaps all of us in some way, limped into the room this morning. In a moment like this, your mind goes exactly to that place. And I will say to you this morning that when Jesus says you're free, you're free indeed. And if you have been forgiven for that sin, and if you are in Christ and have requested forgiveness, you have been forgiven of that sin. Don't accrue guilt to your conscience that Jesus has already removed from it. That's to be the gospel. That's why it is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of our worship because he transforms us that comprehensively. The gospel, and so we are motivated to go and to preach and to share, yes, because we care first and foremost about seeing people go from abiding under the wrath of God to the favor of God, being freed from the penalty of sin, but also we go and we see life change in people who come to faith in Christ. And then we see the culmination of that when even their consciences and even their, their memories are reshaped because they've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So what is the missionary's message? What about it? We must embrace it boldly. We should expect it to work powerfully. Now just see with me very quickly in verse 17. Ultimately, we have to embrace the gospel personally. And I would be committing ministerial malpractice this morning if I just kind of assumed, assumed, assumed that since you're here on Saturday morning, everyone surely knows Christ. I think it's fair to say if you're on Saturday morning missions conference, you probably do. But notice verse 17. Paul concludes this encapsulating statement about the gospel. He's about to reopen and unpack the straightforward statement. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Verses 16 and 17, especially this great statement, it's what captured the reformer Martin Luther's heart, showed him that the practices of Rome and his monastic expectations all were woefully inadequate to make him right, with Christ, right before God. Here he presents this great word, the righteous man shall live by faith. In it, in it, the gospel, the message of Christ. In it, the gospel, the message of Christ. The righteousness of God is revealed. You see it, you held up God's holy, righteous standard. And then by faith, you're made right. I'm in the business of theological education, and part of that is issuing quizzes, tests, papers, final exams. Pop quiz this morning. To get into heaven... You must have a perfectly righteous life. True or false? False? True? See a lot of conflicted people out here. The answer is true. To get into heaven, you must have a perfectly righteous life. But the glorious news is it doesn't have to be yours. It's Jesus's. And so as we go about the work of the missionary, we must first make sure our hearts are rested in Christ. And by faith, we have been made right with him. And as we are, that propels us all the more out as his agents. Well, I've went a few minutes past my allotted time, so we should pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for these verses. And Father, would you continue to arrest our hearts in this regard? Father, let us never lose the wonder of the gospel. Father, let us never lose the wonder that not only would you save us, but you would entrust us to be your spokespersons.
to be your missionaries, to be about the work of the Great Commission. And Father, would you help us this day as we continue to think clearly and carefully about these things to be stirred to greater faithfulness in this regard. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.